Good evening, members of the Cincinnati Public Schools community. It is such a pleasure to be with everyone this evening. My name is Monica Santana Rosen, and I am the CEO of Alma Advisory Group, and we've been honored to support the Cincinnati Public Schools board and community throughout this critical search for the next superintendent of Cincinnati Public Schools. Tonight, you're gonna get to hear each of our three finalist candidates meet and spend time with members of the Cincinnati Public Schools community. This is the panel of individuals who represent parents and community members of Cincinnati Public Schools. In a moment, each of them is going to introduce themselves. They're gonna share their name and their role and their connection with the community. As you may know, uh, recently we requested to the community to nominate individuals to participate in five different interview panels. So our finalists spent time today with teachers, with principals, with civil service staff, and with students. And now they're getting to meet with parent and community members. We had, in the end, over 200 individuals nominated to participate as panelists. And we worked uh, to ensure a group of panelists that well represented the Cincinnati community at large. This panel that will be asking the questions tonight received over 100 suggested interview questions. They reviewed all of those and painstakingly decided which questions they wanted to ask to represent the interests and the areas of concerns of the Cincinnati Public Schools community. Uh, we're so grateful for everyone who has participated in this process and especially to our interview panelists who are representing everyone today. And with that, I would love to ask for each of our panelists to go ahead and introduce themselves, provide your name, provide your role and your connection to the Cincinnati community. Tommy Lewis, local business owner and OTR over the Ryan community, uh, also a resident of College Hill community and a CPS business contract vendor, and also a parent of a 10th grader in, at Walnut Hills High School. Hi, I'm Julia Garcia. I am a parent of a Pleasant Ridge Montessori student, and I'm also the daughter and wife of CPS educators, um, and I live in Pleasant Ridge. Hello, I'm Chanel Ingram, and I've been a resident of Cincinnati since 2013. I have a high schooler at Gamble Montessori, and I have two elementary children at Midway. Good evening, I am Lisa Bolden Carter. I am a proponent of public school education. My father retired from the State Department of Education. My sister is a principal in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Two of my, my two children are graduates of Cincinnati Public School, and I now have two grandchildren who are in Cincinnati Public School. And I am here because I believe that perhaps we can all make a difference. Good evening. Uh, my name is Craig Rosen. I am a parent of two students at Spencer Center, junior high and high school. I am a former tri-chair with the previous superintendents and the president of CFT. Uh, sellers of the Budget Commission for CPS. I've served on instructional leadership teams. I've been on the local school decision-making committee and proud to serve the community however best I can. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Ozzie Davis, former board member, uh, Wanted Hills and Rockdale graduate, a CPS graduate, uh, longtime LSDMC uh, member, two decade LSDMC member, former uh, chair of Parents for Public Schools, uh, former chair of the Cincinnati Promise, uh, co-chair of Preschool Promise Initiative, a very uh, ardent supporter of youth. I'm, I'm, they call me the, the hood advocate. Good evening, my name is Kendra Mapp and my role uh, or my connection to the district is 
I am an alum of CPS. I graduated from Hughes Center. I am also a parent. Um, I have a first grader at Data Montessori and a ninth grader at Gamble Montessori High School. I am a licensed professional counselor and have done contract work with CPS. Um, I am a current member of school board school and uh, I have a, another uh, host of other um, connections to CPS, but I'll end there and I'm just excited to be a part of this process. Hello, my name is Dawn Merritt and I am an alumni of CPS schools as well. Um, I participate, I'm actually with class three of school board school board. And I also partner with a lot of the Cincinnati uh, public schools um, as one of the vendors. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Hello, my name is Diana Seifel and I am a resident of East Walnut Hills. Um, I've been there for about 15 years. I'm actually from across the river in Kentucky, but a big public school supporter. Both of my parents were public school teachers and my mother-in-law as well. Um, I have a daughter at Clark Montessori, seventh grade, and then I have a son at North Avondale. Good evening. Uh, my name is Tracy Greeley Howard. I am a resident of Hartwell for the last 20 years. I'm a transplant from outside of Cincinnati. Um, I am a teacher at the Zoo Academy, one of the magnet programs through Hughes STEM. And prior to that, I was a teacher at uh, Woodward Career Tech. I'm a science teacher and a career tech teacher. Good evening. I'm Leslie Silvernagel. I'm a CPS alumni. I graduated from SCPA and I'm a CPS parent. I have an eighth grader at Walnut Hills High School. I'm a former um, high school science teacher, district administrator, and now I'm a STEM advocate in the region. Hi, I'm Trent White. I'm a resident of Hyde Park and I teach at Aiken for the last four years, 10th grade history this year. Okay, thank you so much. Um, since I see our three candidates at the front, I'm wondering if each of you would like to also introduce yourself and you'll have the chance later as well. Get your microphone. Good evening, my name is Tiani Ahmad, Interim Superintendent of Cincinnati Public Schools. It is a pleasure to be here today. I am a resident community member of Cincinnati. Uh, Actually, I closed on a house in Evanston. That's why I said Evanston uh, earlier, um, instead of Avondale. Um, next week, next week, um, the community served me, and it's an honor to serve the community. I started out as a teacher at Rockdale, a principal, the founding principal who we opened High Park School, who served High Park, Oakley, um, in the Evanston community, and now had the great fortune to be in the role to serve as a central office administrator serving the 52 communities of Cincinnati. Thank you for giving your time here today and I look forward to talking to you more. Thanks, Tiana. Good afternoon, how's everyone? My name is Ironetta Wright. I am currently Deputy Superintendent of Schools in Detroit Public Schools Community District. I spent the last five years in Detroit. Um, I was recruited there by my superintendent that was the superintendent in Duval County. Um, I am native Jacksonvillean. I was in Jacksonville, Florida my entire life. Uh, and I was served in the school district there for 25 years before transitioning to Detroit Public Schools Community District. I am pleased to be here. This has just been an amazing experience um, the way that the team has really gone into the diversity of the district and the teams that we've met with today. It's just been amazing. And I know that tonight is going to be equally so. So I look forward to getting to know each of you better. Thank you. Good evening, Marlon Stiles. I'm a proud black male educator. Um, I thrive in environments where I get to serve children, period, end of story. Huge, huge, high energy leader that believes all children can and will be suc uh, successful in life. I believe it is our duty and our obligation to serve them as best we possibly can. Staunch advocate for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Unapologetic about the work that I do when it comes to serving children in school systems. A true track record around putting students at the center of what we do. Uh, I really enjoy the opportunity to passionately serve communities, build strong relationships uh, centered around trust, and more importantly, I enjoy building relationships with students. I love walking into schools and knowing which students like the Ohio State Buckeyes or which students don't. Uh, that is about relationships, not just with adults, but for children as well. Really want to praise the Cincinnati Public Schools Board of Education and community for the process. It has been rigorous. 
Um, and I do want to congratulate uh, the other two finalists that are with me here tonight. Um, I really want to congratulate you on the process and your search for your next leader of the school district and the community. Good luck tonight. Hopefully you bring the same passion and energy that the students did. They were electric. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we're going to get started in just a moment. I just want to share with those who are viewing the live stream the way that our format is going to be. Uh, each interview will be approximately 45 minutes long, and your hardworking panel is taking no breaks. Uh, so our first interview is going to commence uh, momentarily with Tiane at 6 at 25 p.m. We will uh, transition to Ironetta Wright. And then at 7.10 p.m., we will uh, transition to Marlon Stiles. Uh, the evening will complete by 8 p.m. Uh, our format this evening, the panel has selected eight questions. Uh, we are hoping to cover those in about 35 minutes and then allow the candidates the opportunity, uh, if we have time, to ask a couple questions of their own to the community. Um, so we're going to try to stick with about um, you know, three to four minutes per question. Again, as we know, this event is being live streamed and recorded, so it will be available online for anyone to view. Uh, panelists are gonna be submitting their feedback, but we want to hear from the community as well. Your voices matter. So we invite everyone to please watch these interviews and submit your feedback. We have a community survey that's available online on the CPS website which is cps-k12.org. So if you go there, you'll see the survey. Everyone has until 5 p.m. Sunday, February 13th. And I realize the timing is not great. So maybe I'm just gonna change the deadline right now. I really, okay. We're not gonna do anything on Sunday uh, except watch football. So we will do Monday at noon on February 14th. Real time change there. Um, Thank you so much, I appreciate it. And with that, we will begin with our first interview. Thank you so much, Irenetta and Marlon. All right. Thank you, Tiane. As soon as you get settled there, Chanel is gonna ask our first question. Good evening. Now, my question has two parts. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. How will you make student-centered decisions based on the individual school's needs within such a large district with diverse needs? And the second part of that question is, how will you gather the individual needs of schools and groups within the district? Thank you. Um, we've done a great job with student-centered decision-making, but we need to leverage that to student-driven decision making. Um, and the way you do that is through co-creation, co-creation with students. So I had the fabulous opportunity uh, this afternoon to meet with about 24 young folks. They had great ideas of how to move our district forward with addressing equity, with addressing curriculum, with addressing staffing needs, and COVID. So when, when um, Clearly having a voice, but it's not acted upon, it's still silenced. So for me, it's to uh, develop opportunities, platforms for stakeholders to get together. And part of that stakeholder group is, is students. Uh, the second part of the question, can you read again? Yes, mm -hmm. It's how will you gather the individual needs of schools and groups within the district? Because CPS is already formatted as a site-based system, we have to use the systems that are in place. They have worked for a long time. We have LSDMCs, local uh, school decision-making committees, that is made up of community members, council members, uh, partners, teachers, students. A student is supposed to be on that committee and staff and teachers, right? We have the ILT in place, with it, which is teachers and parents. So the first thing I would do would be to go to those sites, talk to the individuals who are represented the, the schools. From there, 
I'm one who loved to be in the classroom. So I want to see it in action. The magic is in the classroom. So I want to go in and observe for myself. And, and one of the things that I have always done as a teacher, I really never had conversations with teachers. I had conversations with students. What are you learning? What's going on today? They will tell you they are honest, they are transparent. So gathering information in that informal way. But there are other ways you can do that. You can use uh, surveys. I had tea with Tiane um, during my 90-day plan and met with over 100 uh, meetings, different stakeholders uh, through the first 90 days in my role as interim superintendent. I will give the information out that will have exactly my recommendation of what have I learned? How did I gather that information? And to be quite honest, we are pretty much all on the same page. Students, community members, staff, leadership, board members are heard over and over again. We want our kids to be happy. We want our kids to have options when they graduate from CPS. So that's, I would continue that work that I have started as the interim superintendent. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to have Julia ask the next question. Hi. I have to apologize in advance for this long question. Okay. <laughs> Currently, there's an incredible disparity between the resources that are allotted to the schools. And sometimes this occurs between higher income neighborhoods and underserved communities. And sometimes we see the differences between schools even within the same neighborhood. The disparity results in students having access to very different coursework, resources, and support. At the same time, this disparity reinforces the segregation that is persisting in our district. As our superintendent, how would you work to disrupt this pattern and ensure that all students can access the same opportunities and supports? Great question, and I, I love, you, you gave the answer. We need to disrupt the system. Um, we have to be innovative. The way you do that, and, and it's um, clear, it's a lot of research on equitable funding for, for schools. One, we have to determine what do all students receive? All, it doesn't matter what neighborhood, what do all students receive as far as textbooks, and I'm speaking as a principal who reopened High Park, which was closed because of lower enrollment and um, achievement. I opened the school without any textbooks. Right? It started with 100 kids. When I was there three years, we had to rent and lease space from a bank because people came to the school. And now there's trailers there. And what we did was really we were really clear on the needs of what we had to have as a school district, as a school. So I looked at excellent models across uh, the country. Tier one, class sizes, books, um, making sure that we had support services in place. That should be at all schools, right? Then you look at tier two, then that's programmatic needs. So if you are Fairview German, what do you have to have in place? You have to have a German teacher. If you are a Montessori school, you have to have the materials because it's very specific to that philosophy, right? So you are meeting the needs by giving all kids what they need in tier one. Then you look at the program, programmatic needs, and then you also look at the needs of the community. Cincinnati Public Schools will always be in this condition of trying to um, provide equitable support because our neighborhoods are segregated. And until we fix that, that's going to trickle into our schools. We're not going to fix that, right? So we have to openly discuss what is happening in our communities. Another way to do that is to ensure we need to address affordable housing. We need to address sustainable wages for our family. So it's beyond the school. We have to pull down the silos, work with city council, work with our elected officials, work with um, our partners. There's wonderful partnerships, right? So a prime example of that is our social emotional learning supports that we have at every school. We didn't always have that at every school, but that's a clear example of tier one. All kids need mental health. 
support, right? So until we um, start to have those conversations, be truthful in um, what's happening in our community, we will never succeed. So we have to have honest conversations, gather the information, be clear what we want for all of our students, and then make it happen and act upon it, and then measure the success of happy kids graduating from high school. Thank you. We're going to have Lisa ask our third question. Good evening. Currently, there is an incredible disparity between the resources. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong one. I need my glasses. In general, test scores indicate achievement. Would you agree with that? In general? Yes. yes. Okay. Why do you think there is such disparity in these test scores in Cincinnati public schools? An example would be the test performance in schools re resembling High Park and South Avondale, two opposite mm -hmm. communities. Mm -hmm. Am I correct? You are correct. Okay. Why do you think this inequity exists and what is your strategy for closing the achievement gap in a significant number of our schools? Great question and one of my uh, passionate areas. Um, it's going to go back to what I said about our communities, right? So it is clear when you are in poverty, you don't have the books in the household. There is a tremendous difference in vocabulary development. So we are entering into a space, whether it's a Hyde Park situation, whether it's a South Avondale situation, where we have to close gaps before we even start school. Um, that's why Preschool Promise is an awesome, awesome gift that our community gave to Cincinnati Public Schools and our community of Cincinnati, that we can attack those issues early and making sure that our kids are ready for kindergarten. Early literacy is the key. Are you so, suggesting that this early literacy is the key? Or are you suggesting that it is the difference in the incomes and the types of home our children are coming from? Because we're talking about standardized tests after children have been in the system mm -hmm. for a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. I would say that the person who was a part of the success of looking at third grade achievement. When I first started as deputy superintendent, the third grade scores were roughly around 35 to 40%, right? So again, I'm gonna stand behind early intervention for early childhood when our students enter. It's very critical and it's important. And so our partnership with Children's Hospital is also important where we are um, making sure we have books in the homes earlier, vocabulary development, parent workshops. So we're doing all of that. But then when we get the kids here, it is our responsibility to continue to close that gap. And we do that um, in a variety of ways. So I said earlier, when I started five years ago, our third grade scores were roughly 40% uh, every year. They steadily climbed. They climbed um, until we got to 66% over these past few years. And what we know works is access to grade level content, acceleration to learning, is something that's called high dosage tutoring, that you have small group intervention with our students. The other thing that works is a clear um, effort to teach phonics because there has been a long debate whether you teach phonics or not. Coding is important. The research is clear there. And then lastly, content. Students need to see themselves in the curriculum as early as um, preschool when we start. So we make sure that we have a curriculum that is diverse, representative of our student population, that we use science to make sure our kids are progressing. And then we can't forget the human element. They are babies. We need to express the joy in reading. We need to make sure that they understand it is a wonderful opportunity to be a reader. And so for the last year, I have really had the um, focus and intentionality around 
every first grader will read. So what we started uh, just last year and using our technology is that our students, our first grade readers were very um, specific that they're reading aloud. I go into the classrooms and read to, to students. We have community members coming into reading to students. So it shouldn't be laborious. It should be a joy to teach reading. Um, and so again, I, I do um, believe in early intervention. I do believe that it is our uh, moral obligation to close those gaps. And I do feel like um, our families, some of my families are starting off at a disadvantage and it's not their fault. It is not their fault. They are assets in our com community. It's not a deficit mindset, but because we know that the playing field is not even, and that's what I'm bringing up today, it is not even, what is our responsibility as educators to close the, that gap? Thank you. Thank you. Brent, we'll ask our next question. Based on what you know about our district, what do you want to accomplish in the first year of your potential leadership within Cincinnati Public Schools? How would you prioritize, organize your team, and move these endeavors forward? And how soon should we see, begin to see or expect to see improvements from these actions? I heard loud and clear from the community communication. We have to strengthen the way we communicate and be accessible. So some of the things that I would do with the community, with our schools, with our students, it's something that's called um, a profile of a student. We will build the profile of the student. What, when a student leaves CPS, what are the characteristics that they should have? Passionate, um, being kind, critical thinker, a team player. Um, whatever those thoughts are, then we have to find the adults to create that environment. Kids are watching us day in and day out. We have to be compassionate. We have to be kind. We have to have the love and joy of learning. So I use that as a, um, an example, but those are Tiane's ideas of what I would love for a CPS graduate to have. But it's important when you are serving others in the community to ask the community what they want. So in my first year, that's what I would be doing. I would be going out in the community, um, talking to our students, talking to our partners, talking to our families, and asking them, what do you think is success for your child in CPS? And working together with stakeholders to create that opportunity. We are at a crossroad in um, Cincinnati Public Schools. We are in the third year of our strategic plan. The time is right, the time is now. So hopefully you will come back and help us with our strategic plan because just a plan with no uh, actions, goals, or measures is useless. It's, a, it's just a dream deferred, basically. So we have to put uh, pen to paper and put it down in writing and decide what are the metrics we are going to use to determine success. Is it academics and improving early literacy scores? Is it making sure that all of our kids have access to mental health services? Is it recruiting more African American so it's more representative of our student population? Right? So those are some things that I see for myself, but my role initially I will not have, I'm going to be honest with you, I will not have the best idea. That is not my role. My role is to create the environment where the best ideas can happen. And I have to create those platforms and those opportunities to allow for those discussions. So in my first year, to, to, to wrap it up, I want to build relationships. I want to provide opportunities for people to have a voice and be honored. And then I want to establish an action plan so we can actually move the work forward and have measures to determine that we are successful as we go and then we can adjust if need be. Thank you. Thank you. Ozzy is going to ask our next question. Hi, sis. Hi. How will parent, student, principal, teacher and staff voice be utilized or implemented into your strategic plan as a superintendent? 
And can you give me an example of how you've used stakeholder voice in decision making as a district or building administrator? Yes. That goes back to what we already have in place. We have curriculum councils where it's led by teachers. We have ILT, we have LSDMCs. We have DSLs that go in and support our principals. Those are directors of school leadership. You will have a student superintendent that serves students and very clear on the purpose. So going out and making sure that I'm in classrooms and also um, participating in those opportunities. Mr. Ozzie, if you can tell me the last, second part of that question. Give an example. Give an of, example of how you, how you use stakeholder voice in, uh, yes. in your decision making. A clear example, it was just yesterday we had a board meeting. So part of my role as deputy superintendent, I've been in a role in five years, it was clear that we didn't have current curriculum material. That goes back to my conversation of tier one of what all schools should have access to. So just yesterday, our science curriculum council presented to the board and administration on um, a curriculum that they would like for us to purchase. It has been 21 years since we had new science curriculum material. Now, this was the process. First, teachers were selected, representatives, to review all of the materials. We used data, a rubric, to determine certain things. So it, it, we call them must-haves. Is it representative of our student population? Is it aligned to the curriculum? Is it uh, student friendly? Is it customizable for a teacher uh, working in the first year compared to the 30th year for science? So teacher voice was clear there. About a month ago, we had an awesome, and this is bringing in partners and parents and students. We had an awesome evening at the Cincinnati Museum where all the materials were laid out, families came in, students came in to observe and work with the materials, give feedback. We had over a thousand people participate. A thousand people participate in the selection of science materials. So not only did we have teachers, we had community members, we had parents, we had uh, family members. We then allow teachers to select the variety of materials to pilot some of the lessons in the classroom, come back and give us feedback, because it could all look good on paper, right? But until you open the, the saran wrap and really get into the material. So our teachers then worked with our students in those materials and students gave us feedback on the material. So again, this is critical. All stakeholder group helping us select um, a science curriculum that we post to the board yesterday. So that is a clear example of getting everyone involved, everyone involved to make such a critical decision around what materials, resources, instructional uh, supports, and measurements to help with science in the next few years uh, with our students. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Yeah, good evening. Um, okay. Fiscal stewardship is a critical role of the superintendent, especially given the size of our district and our state funding formula. Can you share some recent examples of fiscal responsibility, which also allowed for new and innovative opportunities, which CPS has been known for over the years? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, great question. Most recently, we know during the pandemic, there are some gaps in education, right? We, had, we were dealing with the gaps before, and then there were certain uh, populations that we saw was greater impacted by that. Then we looked at which content areas it aff affected literacy the most. So what we decided to do was use our ESSER funds, right, to hire 45 reading specialists to combat those gaps. Because if you think about it, if you started two years ago with CPS as a kindergarten student, you're really first getting uh, in-person instruction for the first time, but two years, is, it was remote. And we all know nothing beats the in-person interaction of a teacher, right? 
So what we decided to do, and we looked at the research, and that's what the high dosage tutoring is. We made sure we wanted to invest in a strategy that will yield high results. So when I talked about those test scores going up in third grade, that's what we did. We had opportunities to customize and individualize education for our students, and we saw that. So what we decided to do was to use funding to support that area of literacy. So I think part of being fiscally responsible is really being targeted and then using the funds that you know will yield high results and give you great impact for your goals and then measuring it. So now we're in the process of measuring it. But in the past, we have seen gains with that. So that's just kind of that piece there. Uh, what we're working on this year as a superintendent, you work very closely with the treasurer. You're arm in arm with the treasurer. And, and myself and the treasurer are working on what is the tier one, what everyone receives. Because if you don't have that, you can't say that you are providing equitable education because then it's just wish list coming out. So we're saying what everyone is receiving in tier one, we're working on that right now. And then looking at the layers of program and then school-based needs to help fund. So that should be coming out soon and I'm excited to uh, work with our treasurer to kind of shift our, our thinking and be intentional and purposeful in our funding of schools. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if Elizabeth arrived. If not, it would be Kendra asking question number seven. Good evening. Good evening. CPS is known for having a strong business partnership, community mentoring programs, athletics, and alumni. How will you continue to grow and leverage these partnerships? It's relationships. All of this is based on relationships. This right here is, is not by chance, right? You, you're being selected to participate in the selection of the superintendent is not by chance. It's relationships and the relationship starts today. Um, so I would continue to build those relationships with wonderful organizations like ABC who has been partnering with us for not only athletics, but uh, enrichment, progr enrichment programs. We have wonderful relationships throughout the city from CRC to the YMCA um, who helped us in, in, in many areas when I'm thinking about the pandemic. Um, so we will continue to have and build on those relationships. The only thing that I would say differently is the co-creation of what can we do differently so more kids have access. More kids have access to fine arts. More kids have access to athletics. More kids have a choice to decide um, where they would like to plug in. The research is clear that um, a well-rounded child, so it's just not um, a reading score, but it is, you know what? There's an adult in the building that cares about me. That adult can be a fine arts teacher, that adult can be uh, a bowling coach, that adult can be an orchestra uh, enrichment teacher. So finding a variety of ways that our kids could connect to content and connect to adults and the way we can fund those opportunities is through relationships and, and leveraging those relationships with our community partners. So I would just keep those doors open. Um, and then I, I'm, I'm big on um, data and, and using the data to inform. So again, one of the things that I've done in the role um, was to see, okay, where do we have these opportunities? We did not have ban at all fourth grade schools. This year was the first year. Every fourth grader had access to ban. We did not have uh, African American studies at all of our high schools when our students said, we would like to have those courses. This year, African American studies is at all of our schools. So again, using the data to inform your decision leveraging those relationships to make it happen and then me measuring those success. So I would definitely continue with that work. 
Thank you. Abdeen uh, just contacted me. He's on his way. So we're going to ask Dawn to ask our final question. Good evening. Good evening. Many families feel overwhelmed and are disengaged due to lack of knowledge of all resources available to them. How will you increase parent engagement and provide resources to families? I think we have to recognize there's a cultural difference in how we engage, how people navigate the system. We hear from the same people through our board meetings, right? They understand and feel comfortable of navigating um, those platforms that are in place where you come in every other week and share your ideas, your concerns with the board. The majority of our population um, culturally is different. And being an African-American leader, what I do know, we are very community-based, right? We're not going to go in general on a board meet, uh, platform and, and air our concerns. We are community-based. What we would like for our leaders to do is to come to the community and talk to the people. We are just engaged. We value education just as much. And I say that to say we have to respect and honor the differences in our culture. And as an African-American woman who understands that, I will be in our communities. I've learned so much going to games, sitting next, next to parents. I learned so much just walking in the neighborhood, right? So I think fully community engagement, we just have to ask the people we serve, what is the best way you would like to communicate, right? It's not about bringing donuts to a PTO conference. That's not going to cut it. That's not true engagement. So if you know that you can open, in, the, in our community, we can open the doors and people will let you in and have those conversations. Um, let's do it. Let's have those conversations. I will also say that um, we have to take the opportunity to engage at different hours. Our parents are um, very diverse in their schedule. So it can't just fit in to my schedule as an educator. If you really want true engagement, we should be able to offer it, especially with the technology, anytime, any place, anywhere, right? So I think by just asking the question, what is the best form of communication for you? And then we all know um, to really get communication and engagement out, you have to do things about seven times and say it seven times. Um, and so really continuing to uh, partner with our, our families, understand and value that they uh, want to be a part of it, and it is our job to provide those opportunities for them to engage. But I know just in my time as interim superintendent, uh, because the majority of our, our families um, are people of color and just going out to the community, I understood very quickly to go to the barbershop, I have been, to go participate at games, to sit in uh, art shows, um, has yielded a lot of information that people would not have necessarily shared via email, via board meeting. So you have to know the community. You have to be a part of the community. Um, I have made a conscious decision. I live in the community. So I talked about buying a home in Emerson, but I live in the community right now. I made a conscious decision to be a teacher here. I made a conscious decision to be a principal here. I made a conscious decision to serve here uh, in a district role because I want to be a member of the community that I serve. And when you are a member of that community, it is easier to engage and it comes very natural and authentic. So I just look forward to, to having those opportunities with community members from a diverse uh, backgrounds of, of schools in, in, in the 67 schools. I know some, I hear people go 65, but we actually have 67 schools in our district to make sure that all of our families are seen and feel valued and welcome.
Thank you, Tiane. So now you get to ask the questions of the community. We have uh, just a few minutes here uh, till about 6.23, so about seven, eight minutes um, for any questions you want to ask. Thank you. Um, just thank you. My first question is around, so when you all introduce yourself, there is a lot of rich history from um, I'm a graduate, my kids are here, my uh, grandkids go, um, spouses are part of the community. So you know a lot about CPS. I have two questions in the form of one. Whoever you hire as the superintendent, what are those traditional things that you say don't touch? This is working. It has been working. Uh, we love it. Don't touch it. And then the flip side of that, where are some opportunities for growth for CPS? Yes, ma'am. I'm not sure about the don't touch area. I'm going to leave that alone because my kids are probably as old as you are. But for growth, I believe that what you said about reading is fundamental. Mm -hmm. And I believe that for growth, we have to look at every single solitary opportunity. So when our kids are in one through three, that they are reading across the district. Mm -hmm with everyone else, that there is not that disparity between South Avondale and Rockdale and High Park and some That's of the right. other districts. We have got to get our children, all of them, because they're all of our children. Mm -hmm. We've got to get them on a level playing field so that one school is not dominating when they are looking at Wanty Hills or Spencer School or some of the other schools that everyone that leaves that third grade, by the time they get to the sixth grade, it is an equal playing field. Thank you. Um, I also, uh, I don't have too many opinions about that which we shouldn't touch, but um, a couple of things that I would like to see a change in, one of them is, you know, we talk about diversity a lot, and um, I'm from the immigrant Latinx community, and I do feel like that is one that can oftentimes get looked over just in terms of um, accessibility. Yeah. So when I was growing up and I was a CPS student, um, English was my second language. It was very limited at first. I was lucky enough to have resources throughout that eventually helped me learn the language I need to learn and catch up to everybody else. But that's just not available in every school especially those that are underserved where we have a lot of children that are DACA recipients and, and they don't speak any English. Um, so they're at a huge disadvantage. And then the other thing that I would like to see a change in is in a district-wide enforcement of safety protocols and PBIS protocols because what a lot of us are seeing is that the children that are in the underserved communities, they're not getting the attention and they're not learning in as safe of environments as, for example, my daughter is in, in Pleasant Ridge, because all of that is left to the discretion of the individual principals. They scared on the don't touch, right? So I'm not that scared. Um, you know, the emphasis on early education must be uh, accelerated. I don't want you to touch it. You already, you already have your foot on the pedal really good. Just keep pushing. That emphasis on early education is, uh, to me, the strength of the district at this time. Uh, where I see opportunity for growth is making our, making our families feel loved through their children. There are, a lot of our children are um, of all strata, black, white, um, rich, poor, are feeling unloved, and, they're, and, and they live in an environment where there is a lovelessness, and the schoolhouse has such a great opportunity to provide that love by raising high expectations, smiling at somebody. You know, I've seen it done. I'll speak Belinda Tubbs Wallace language all day because I've seen it. I seen it at Rockdale, and I see it at Woodward. He brings love into a building, and if our district could really emulate that type of 
Man, just, then we'll see those those scores go up just like they did rock down, just like they will and will. And I actually have something that I don't want you guys to touch. Um, not being from here, what attracted me to CPS for my children was the sense of community. There is a huge sense of community with CPS students and alumni and teachers. But like you said, there's a lot of families that don't know how to get involved. There's a lot of schedules that don't allow you to be at the board meetings. Um, so I would like for you or whoever is hired to try to foster those relationships. Like you said, different communities, like different type of platforms. So just basically communication and getting the information out there. Mine is gonna be really, really short. Um, you mentioned being in the community. And when I say in the community, at the games, at everything where the parents are there, because for decades, we've had so many people sitting at the top who've never even lived in Cincinnati Public Schools District. They've never even been in the community. So how can you serve the community if you know nothing about it? So that is an area of growth that I see throughout this Cincinnati Public School District that needs to improve and it needs to improve very fast. Because like Dr. O said, families need to feel loved. They need to feel like someone cares about them. You will get the results if that continues. Um, I think for me as a outsider-ish, if you will, um, I would not touch the Montessori system. It makes us very special, I think. And when I explain to people who aren't from Cincinnati what it is, because I, I didn't really know what it was, and I explain it to them, everyone says, well, why doesn't everyone do that? And so um, I'm, I love that my kids are in Montessori. It's not for everybody, but it was great for my kids, and I love that it's an option that we can provide. Um, Keep on keeping on. That's all I got. So for me, one thing that I would say um, is important to not touch is having access to those programs that are going to cultivate the students and create pathways to higher education or vocational or trade school. One thing um, that resonates with me is the fact that I was one of those students to have a teacher to say, you know what, I think this will be important to you. Go to this meeting, learn more information about this program and what it has to offer. So I think if we continue to stay on that path, we'll be able to see more success within our graduates. Um, one thing that I think is an area of growth is um, being in the mental health profession, recognizing that there are there is room for more support, right? Particularly around when there is a suicide, when there's a death in the family. A lot of students are left to kind of navigate that process on their own. They don't really have the, the empathy um, from the teachers or the staff or dealing with it in silence. So I think that's an area of growth for um, our district to really learn or have training um, to deal with mental health issues and um, to support the students when they are grieving. Hi, um, I agree with what everybody else has said about not changing what, what people love. And I think that's a great question that should be put out to the community because I think like this room, you're gonna get a lot of different answers. One of the things I'd like to see is, uh, you had mentioned the strategic plan. We're in year three. Um, there hasn't been much engagement from the community as to where we are, what we believe, and what could improve. Um, my hope is, is that there would be, um, with the direction of the board, uh, would, there would be a new um, way to engage and look where we're at so that we actually have some waypoints to see where we are slipping and where we can improve. Uh, growth is critical. Uh, lastly, I would say, uh, Mr. Davis speaks of this highly, we need to increase our market share I think we have stayed stagnant, just relying on people to come to us. I think we need to go to where the people are in the community. Thank you. Thank you. We are at time. Was anyone else there raising their hand? Well, Tiana, thank you so much for your time this evening. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much.
Thank you. And thank you for the wonderful ideas. I got early literacy. I got vocational uh, choice in uh, learning opportunities and platform. But the most important is love. Love. If we don't have love of love of what we do, love of our families and students, why are we here? So I thank you for sharing and spending your time with me this evening and enjoy the rest of the process. Thank you. Thank you. Then I also have some packets for you that I will leave on this back table that will uh, give you some uh, information of clear um, evidence of my work. Thank you. Hi, Ben, I see you there. Ben, is that you in the back of the room? Okay, thank you. Is that Ironetta right at the front there? It is. Would you like for me to stand, Monica? You want me to sit or worship for a Whatever you like is just fine. Listen, you know, vertically challenged people always want to stand, right? So when I take off my shoe, I'm like 4'11", you know, so I'm, you know, vertical. We just always stand up. But I, I, I wouldn't say great things come in small places. So I, I will sit if that's fine, but I do want to make sure that I'm everyone, um, if that's okay as well. I better That's stand funny. up. I better stand up. I'm good. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Irenetta. We're going to jump right in. Just again, a reminder, we've got about eight questions in the next 35 minutes. So uh, hoping to stick to about three to four minutes per question. And our first question is going to be asked by Chanel. Good evening. Can you hear me? Right here? Yes, yes. Hello. Hi. <laughs> All right, so I have two parts to my question. Um, the first part is how will you make student-centered decisions based on the individual school's needs within such a large district with diverse needs? And the second part is how will you gather the individual needs of schools and groups within the district? Great, so, you know, I start by saying that in my experience, my, in my last role uh, in Duval County Public Schools when I left the district, um, I served 117,000 students in 163 schools across the district, the 20th largest school district in the nation. Um, in transitioning to Detroit Public Schools, I was actually recruited to come to Detroit, to go to Detroit. That was something that was really important to share with the students today as they asked the question, because we had done such great work for students in Duval County uh, that we were really going to Detroit to really rebuild the school district. So when my superintendent became the superintendent in Detroit, he actually recruited me to come from uh, Duval County to go to Detroit and it was just a decision that was just the most appropriate decision in terms of being able to serve students and rebuild that school district. So that school district actually has 106 schools uh, that I oversee and when I got there we had 40, about 49,000 students. Now we serve 53,000 students. Um, as an assistant superintendent and all of this is relative to your question. As an assistant superintendent my uh, second role as an assistant superintendent I serve the 36 lowest performing schools in the district. Um, that information is, is online at fldoe.org. Um, those schools were under state sanctions. And what that meant in that particular district is that we had to make options for the schools if they did not show improvement based on the accountability system. And we were an A to F system. Florida has been an A to F system in terms of grading um, for over 20 years. And so those schools, either we had to turn the school around 
or we had to close the school, turn the school over to an emergency management organization or a charter school organization, or we had to remove 90% of the students from the school. So those are the kind of confines that we were working under within those schools. I had 36 of them um, where I was the assistant superintendent. I had a couple of executive directors, but I served over 50,000 students in those 36 schools. So in terms of thinking about the size of the district, you know, that is one of the things that excites me, honestly, about Cincinnati, because it is right between the work that I've done in Duval County and the work that we've been able to rebuild in Detroit. And the size is still a very manageable size to touch everything that's happening in the district, which is important. So when we think about equity and what happens through equity and student equity, I, I think that we start the conversation first, and I shared this with students earlier, we really start the conversation with equality first. Equality is making sure that everyone has at least the same thing, right? That we have the resources are the same across the district as much as possible, so that we have the same opportunities for all students across the district. When we start talking about equity, we're then talking about meeting the individual needs within the school based on where the students are. The funding model for, for Ohio um, is, is, is beginning to resemble an equity funding model, right? Um, which is what I worked in in Florida. We don't have that in Michigan, but in Ohio, they're beginning to at least look at, it's not perfect, it's just getting started, you know, we, it needs to be solidified so that we have it for a period of time, but we're just getting started to look at how we are giving school districts more based on their needs. So what's, what's happening with your special needs population, what's happening with transportation. If your school district has a larger percentage of certain students, are you getting then additional funding, you know, for that? So in thinking about the school district, we really want to think about it the same way even understanding that there's autonomy at the school level for programming and what that programming looks like, how from the district perspective, are we then able to match our funding with the needs of what's happening in the school so that it, we are really, really looking at equity. And I know in our district, the CFO is a partner of the superintendent, so that's a partner of mine where we will work together in terms of that, but really looking at our different funding streams what's happening with our different title funds, so that then as we're really looking, and I'm talking Title I, Title II, Title III, Title IV, what's happening with those dollars, so that we're then able to match the priorities that are happening in the school district. We did it at, through a, a student allocation model that's very different than the models that um, we had been accustomed to, and it, it was just one that worked for our district because it did give a way to really try to get to the equity that we're talking about. So if you have students, you know, more ELL students, or if you have more special needs students within the school, having worked in every capacity in the school building, you understand that those varying needs calls for some different things that need to happen in the school building. Thank you. Julia is going to ask the second question. Hi, this is a long question. Um, currently, there is an incredible disparity between the resources sources allotted to schools. Sometimes this occurs between higher income neighborhoods and the underserved communities, and sometimes we see the differences between schools even within the same neighborhoods. The disparity results in students having access to very different coursework, resources, and support. At the same time, this disparity reinforces the segregation that's persisting in our district. As our superintendent, how would you work to disrupt this pattern and ensure that all the students can access the same opportunities and support. Thank you. So I really think the first thing that we have to do is really get a good pulse on where we are currently. I'll use the term audit, but as I'm using the term audit, I'm really talking about just digging in deeper to what's already happening in school buildings. You know, you see a level of disparity when you look at the performance in schools in the district, which was something else that was attractive to me because that's work that I know, it's work that I've done. And so you see it. Before you can really, and I say from, from my standpoint, before I can really come in and say, I would remove this, I would do this differently, I would take this away, I really have to dig in a little bit to see what currently is. What is the current state of affairs that's happening within our schools around the programming piece? In, in, as we think about the shared decision-making model, and what we look at in funding and school leadership and needs and 
what's addressed within the individual schools, a lot of that comes from within the school building. Like, you know, you have principals that have identified this is an interest for our school. This is an interest for our community. We have staff that want to be involved in this. So that's how we're looking to move forward. We then have to ask the question if that's the best model. And if that is the best model, how then as the district do we organize our resources? And I'm talking about resources of time. I'm talking about resources of people and then resources of funding. How do we organize our resources to then support those things? The second piece to that would be looking at if we're maintaining that model after we collect the data, collect the data through, the, through an audit process, and then talk about what we're seeing through that process. If we say yes, this is the direction that we're looking to go, then what are the different options that happen at each level to determine what needs to happen next? So for example, if we're doing the audit and we determine, to your, to your point, one school in the neighborhood has really high quality curriculum, the curriculum is aligned with standards, they're continuing to move and grow, so we're going to let them continue to do what they're doing. If another school in the same community is not having the same response, then it may be time to have some conversation with that school, understanding that there's the shared decision making process. This is what the data says. This is what's happening in the school across the street, same community, same population. This is what's happening. Are we going in the right direction? And I think one advantage to that conversation from where I sit is there's really not a job in the school district that I have not done. So the advantage of that is it's not necessarily do as I say, it's do as I've done, number one, or do as I'm doing with you, number two, because it's important for us to work together in a modeling fashion so that we really understand how we get to the core. The third piece to that, and this is what I find a lot of times in working with schools that are trying to transform. Some may look at my resume and they may say, you know, you're just a transformation person, transformation principal, transformation assistant superintendent, transformation deputy. It's never been just about transformation for me. It's always been about excellence because our children deserve excellence. I feel that I'm one of the best. As a matter of fact, I know that I'm one of the best. So if I know that I'm one of the best, why not give of myself to my children? Why not give of the resources that I have? Why not work with my principals so that I'm helping them understand from a different lens? And that's, that's really been an area that's been successful. So the third piece to that really is looking at schools where they're doing everything they know to do to get to the level of improvement that they're looking for, but it hasn't gotten there yet. So it's time for us to think tank. It's time for us to come together and look at some of these lessons learned that have gotten us, gotten other places to the level that they need to go. And you know, that's work that I've been able to do at each capacity. So from the school level, two different schools, you know, it's, it, it, and just one person being the leader, and then you scale that by really taking that work in and working specifically with principals and problem solving with them. Candidate, we've had a request for you to hold your mic a little closer when you speak. Okay, is that better? Thank you. I can speak louder. I'm actually, I'm actually a bit of a singer, so if I need to speak louder, I can do that. I can project my voice if I need to and enunciate and all that good stuff. So, okay. Thank you, Irenetta. That's much more clear. Okay, we'll have Lisa ask the next question. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for being here. Thank you. In general, test scores indicate achievement. Why do you think there is such disparity in test scores in Cincinnati public schools? An example would be the test performances in schools resembling High Park, that is an upper class neighborhood, and South Avondale, which is a lower class neighborhood. Why do you think this inequity exists and what is your strategy for choosing the achievement gaps in a significant number of our schools? I believe to my core that every single child can be successful. Every one of them, every child can be successful. Sometimes what happens in, in urban systems, and I'm coming from two urban systems, Cincinnati is more like Jacksonville, my Jacksonville experience, and honestly, my Detroit experience, but the same thing. Coming from an urban system, sometimes we equate a student's success to their zip code, to their ethnicity. And so therefore, they're not given the same options and opportunities to be successful as students that don't come from a particular neighborhood or don't have a particular ethnicity. 
So I think knowing that to start with, we start with the belief that we have about children and yeah. what it is that they can achieve. That's where it begins in, in, from where I sit in the work that I've been able to do. I think the second is there really has to be an analysis of whether or not the work that our children are engaged in every day meets the level of expectation for how they're going to be assessed. We may or may not like state assessment, but we, we are in an environment that is an accountability driven environment that connects to testing. So one of the things that we do while we're making sure that we service the whole child, because that's another conversation in just a moment, one of the things that we make sure that we do is that we become students of the way that our children are going to be assessed. We know that most standardized tests are not designed to be a positive experience for children of color, for children that are not English speakers first, for, the, for children that are English speakers second, that English is not their first language, for students that have special needs. It's not designed that those students are to be successful when we start thinking about that. It's just the reality. It's not normed on those students. That's not what it is. So when we know that, we have to level the playing field for them by giving them the same opportunities. One, how are they being assessed? Two, is the work that they're doing in class every day aligned to the overall expectations and the standards? Are we giving them the experiences in class that they're going to see when they're no longer in class? The, the other piece to that is really thinking about the balance between exposure to standards level work and the need for remediation. Because some would say, well, right, my children can't do this because they have issues reading here. Well, I am not going to teach them to read any faster by removing from them grade level text. I need to still expose them to grade level text while I'm also helping to remediate their skills that they're deficient in. The other side of the, the deficiency conversation in terms of remediation is our children that are also in need of enrichment. So making sure that we have opportunities within our learning environment so that our, our, our curriculum is aligned it's aligned to the overall standards and there's opportunity for remediation and enrichment. I think the second piece that's aligned to that is making sure that as we are looking at our curriculum and the alignment of the curriculum, do we also ensure that our teachers have the necessary professional development to do what it is that the curriculum is asking them to do. If I'm saying that I want you to assess whether or not students are reading at the level that we expect for them to read, have I equipped teachers with the tools for them to do that? And then once they have those tools, do they have the, the professional development that they need to say, I've identified this problem, now what do I do about it? And that really becomes a recipe for academic improvement. It becomes a recipe for success. So when you look back at, in, at my resume, what you see in the movement of each of those individual schools, overall school environments, overall district and now taking the same thing to Detroit public schools is a way of work, a way of work that starts with belief in children, a way of work that recognizes that the, the way our children are assessed, collective, all our children, the way that they are assessed is not in their favor. So let's learn the way that they're assessed so we make sure that we expose them to that, that we're doing the connection to standards, we're giving them remediation where they need, we're working with our teachers around professional development. And the, the last piece to that is that we are engaging our students in the process so that students know this is where I am, this is where I need to be, this is what I need to do on my part, this is what is gonna happen for me at school. Parents are a part of that conversation, parents and caregivers, so that collectively we are making the school parent and, and, and teacher connection. Thank you so much, Trent. And that school parent and, and student connection, I'm sorry. Thank you, Trent is gonna ask the next question. So based on what you know about the district, what do you want to accomplish in your first year of your potential leadership with CPS? And how would you prioritize, organize your team and move these endeavors forward? And also how soon should we start to see results from those improvements? I think one of the great parts right now, and I've shared this in my conversations with the board, one of the things that excites me right now about the opportunity for transition is the fact that we have a strategic plan that sunset. So we have to determine whether or not those strategies, those areas of focus are still the things that we're looking at continuing to focus on right now. 
And two, we have a new board, a, a new board that's developing. We have three new board members that are now on the board and the potential of a new CEO. And so in thinking about that, it gives an opportunity to really do some partnership work with the board to determine at the board level, what do we think overall as the major priorities? And then taking that conversation back to our overall community. When I'm talking overall community, I'm talking all stakeholders so that everyone has a voice in where we're looking to move forward. One of the reasons that a voice is so important to me for everyone is because when everyone is involved in the conversation, and we will be successful when we move to strategy, when everyone is involved in the conversation to start with, everyone can own the success. So it, it allows not just the individuals that are in the school district to be the ambassadors, but everyone that's a part of the community to be the ambassadors as well. So I think from that, you, you ask, you know, what does success, and that's one of the questions that I generally ask, like after a year, if we're successful, what does success look like? I really think it starts with what we prioritize at the beginning, what we really see as important. Everything that I see right now about CPS is based on data, right? It's based on information that I can find online, information that's at the Ohio Department of Ed site, information that's been provided to me. However, data only tells one part of the story. The other part of that, you really have to get involved, listen, start by listening to those that are already here, that are doing the work, those that are talking about what's going well and what's not. So it's starting with listening conversations, taking that list, those listening conversations, and then from there doing deeper exploration around those conversations, working with those that are already at the district office around their way of work currently, because again, I'm looking at what I think I see and what I think I see has a whole background of information to that. In order for us to then move from there, we look at where are we prioritizing. Once we've set those priorities, we add what our, 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 our key performance indicators are to that and then we monitor along the way. But I really think that's a conversation that we engage in together. If I had to give you a response, if you said, right, you have to give me a response before you move. If I had to give you a response, I think one of the, the first areas that, that I would really want us to focus on as a district is overall communication based on everything that I've seen and everything that I've read. When I look at the responses that were coming from the community and working with, with, the, with the Alma group as they're really talking about what they're looking for in a leader, one of the common themes that you saw that came through there was communication. And so that really seems to be one that as a school district, we can work on together so that we increase and improve the overall communication just by being more transparent. Thank you. Ozzy is going to ask our next question. Arnetta. Yeah. How will parents, how will parent, student, principal, teacher, and staff voice be utilized or implemented and your strategic plan as a superintendent. And can you give us an example of how you've used stakeholder voice in decision-making as a district or building administrator? Absolutely. Um, so I started a little bit with that question earlier. I didn't know that particular question was coming, uh, but you know, stakeholder voice is paramount to our success because it, it, when we begin to do things in isolation and develop plans in isolation, there is not shared ownership. And if there is not shared ownership in what we're doing, there's not a level of collaboration, then it becomes difficult for us to move forward. Because what happens as a part of that, you spend more time trying to convince people that this is the right thing to do, whether having individuals already in place that can help you support the initiative that you're looking for. So if, you, if I think about just very broadly, you know, my first 100 days, what that work would look like, I would see the first 30 to 45 days that would really be just around engagement just around engagement for all stakeholders, conversations in person, conversations at, in every neighborhood, conversations in, 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 in subdivisions, conversations at churches, just listening, opportunities to hear what the community is saying. The community, our parents, our staff, our students, what, what, what's happening, what's going well, what's not going well, and what do you believe that we should focus on next? I believe working in partnership with the board from there, we then move into deeper, deeper exploration. Really, some of my work would start before I actually get on site. Like once they say, okay, right, 
you're the person and I say, yes, let's go. It's engaging with our district level teams around collecting some information so that by the time I'm actually here, a lot of work has already started. What, what's happening in our district office? How are we supporting schools? What is your information that you're looking to share? Taking all of those things together and then from there truly doing evaluation and keeping that open. One of the, the things that's important to me is, you know, having consistent opportunities for engagement. So now I do the way I do those now, and I started those, you know, as a as honestly as a model to what my superintendent did in our other district. I always had opportunities as a principal for people to come in and talk to me. I had an open door policy. I would always say to my team, you know, my, my door is open, but if you come in during the school day, I'm probably not in my office because I'm out on the campus because that's where the work happens. But they would stop me, you know, in the hallway or, or however that went. When I transitioned to the district office, um, I really set up opportunities for staff to, talk, to schedule times to talk to me. So, you know, you want to come in and meet with me. You have conversations. Principals have conversations that they want to have. So we schedule time to do that. He went to a model called Chat with the Soup. And I thought, I like that model, right? And so chat with the soup really was you're just going to different places, you're having conversations, very open, open dialogue and being responsive to the community. I started the sessions called Word, Word, Words with Right. I mean, I know, maybe, maybe when I become a superintendent, I can call it chat with the soup too. But, but mine was Words with Right. And it was just that, open conversation, open dialogue. From there, then moving into more strategic opportunities for conversation. So right now, one of the things that I do monthly in, in partnership with one of my, my board members who we oversee, she's the chairperson of our special education committee. We have a monthly parent engagement session for special education because that was an area where a lot of information was getting out, but we were missing information that was getting to special education parents. So that's one. We do the same thing for all of our parents. We have a monthly parent engagement session. The superintendent does that one. Sometimes I actually do those with them as well. And so it really becomes an opportunity to have the parents come in and just give information. So sometimes we're doing a presentation, other times it's just open, but there's always opportunity for questions and answers. So that really becomes a way of work. If you were to look at a 100 day plan um, that I would have, you would see three things there. One would be a um, consistent parent engagement opportunity monthly. We've learned something through COVID. We've learned that technology allows us to expand, expand those opportunities. So my, my last call for my special education session, I had almost 400 parents on that call. 400 parents on the telephone call. I mean, that may not be a big deal to you, but that's huge to me in any environment where you get 400 parents together at one time. But it was because we were able to use technology. So parents could engage in that conversation and they didn't have to leave work. They could, some of them were doing it in the car, but they were able to engage in that. So what you would see would be a monthly parent engagement session. The other two things that you would see, a advisory group or interactive group for students and one for school leaders. Because that also allows, as the leader of the district, it allows you to really keep a pulse on what's happening throughout the district. So you would see a couple of those things and then begin to do closer work around our business community, who is shepherding that work, have we identified a person to shepherd that work, and then what is our cadence to have that conversation with them. Thank you. Our next question is asked by Craig. Good evening. Good evening. Hi. Uh, fiscal stewardship is a critical role of the superintendent, especially given the size of our district and, as you mentioned, our state funding formula. Can you share some recent examples of fiscal responsibility, which also allowed for some of the new and innovative opportunities, which CPS is known for, like you had mentioned with the students regarding Montessori? How do we continue that innovative approach with limited funds? Yes, great, 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 great. You know, I, I particularly believe, and I've seen this in my experiences, and you know, even more so in, in Cincinnati, when we, where we have nine to 10 Fortune 500 companies, right? I believe that we have a business community that wants to be engaged in the work that we're doing. But oftentimes they don't know how to be engaged. You know, we say we want your help, we want you to be involved, but do we do the best job of talking about what that looks like? Knowing that the Bengals are getting ready to win the Super Bowl, I know, <laughs> right? I know that there's gonna be a lot of opportunity for them to continue to connect with the school system. 
So truly identifying where we need their support. When I think about, and you asked recently, and this is, this is one example that I'll give, but I'll also, I can also give an example for, for Detroit as well. One of the places that I think that I saw that work the best uh, was in the work that we were able to do through the transformation office. And if you look at my resume, you notice that that work, much of that work, aside from the funding that we got from the district, much of that work was done by a $40 million investment that came from the business community. I wanna say that again. A $40 million investment that came from the business community. So you had this business partner that gave 5 million, you had this business partner that gave a million because they were vested in what it was that we were doing. How did they get there? We had a clear plan for what we, need, what we were looking for. We knew what the end was. So when we came to you with the ask, we could tell you, this is where we're looking to go. These are the strategies that we're looking to put in place. These are the milestones that we're gonna monitor along the way. This is how we're gonna work with you to help you understand what the return on investment is for your dollars because we know that you're doing this because you're loving people and you really just want the best for us, but you also have a fiscal responsibility on your side as well. So we wanna make sure that you remain abreast of that. And it was successful. It was amazingly successful because what we wanted to happen for those schools happened. So then our business community really was able to see, okay, you came to us with a clear plan. This is what you were looking to do to move forward. This, one of the second examples that I have with that, that I think was also just an amazing example, was right in the world of COVID. When COVID started, I'm sure that Detroit was not unique in this based on the information that's been shared with me about our current CPS, but we did not have devices for all of our students. So when it came March, 2020, and our students were going home, we had done a great job of getting from a five to, five to one ratio when we got to the district of technology and schools to a one-to-one -one ratio of technology and schools. But what that meant was every student in the school at one time could use a computer. It did not mean that there was a one computer for every student in the district. There is a difference, right? So that was what it meant. So we were then able to work with our business community. This is the need that we have. This is what we're trying to do for our students. And through a $20 million investment from our business community in Detroit, we were able to give devices to our students that were personal devices for the students that they could then use as they were going into virtual learning. And so that was another one of those examples of, this is a need that we have. This is how we're looking to address that need. This is what we need from you. This is how we're going to monitor it along the way. This is the information that we're going to share with you. So in the end, you're able to see what the return on investment was. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Kendra is going to ask our next question. Good evening again. Good evening. CPS is known for having a strong business partnership, community mentoring programs, athletics, and alumni. How will you continue to grow and leverage these partnerships? First of all, by connecting with where we already are, already recognizing that we have strong partnerships, we have strong mentoring programs, we have strong athletics. I oversee athletics now in my district. And so continuing to, to part to, to build on the work that we've already started. I think that's one. I think the second thing is also analyzing where we are within those existing partnerships by talking to the individuals that are in those partnerships, talking to them about the same question, what's going well, what's not going well, and if this is going to be a sustainable partnership, what does that relationship look like? I thought, I think about athletics was one of the questions that I, that I thought about. And you know, I thought about this last night, honestly. So last night, I got in last night, I shared this with the students today. I got in last night and I was looking for kids, right? So I realized that there was a game over at Schroeder. So I went to the Sch Schroeder and West High game last night and I could not help but note, great opportunity. I walked in and I thought, these are my kids. These are the kids I see every day. They happen to be in Cincinnati. But when I'm in Detroit, I see the same kids. When I am in Jacksonville, I see the same kids. And every city that I've been in in the country, guess what? I see the same kids. Where the work happens for me is in the school building. So I'm excited. I'm at the school by myself. Nobody knows me. I walk in. It's great. I'm just there, able to sit and observe. One of the things that I noticed last night was the cheerleaders. Now, the game was great. The kids did a great job. But I noticed the cheerleaders. 
the cheerleaders were doing an amazing job on both ends of the field, of the court, right? This year, um, as a part of, of our athletic programs, we were able to bring back after about 30 years, competitive cheer to our district. We had not had a competitive cheer in about 30 years. These kids were already ready for competitive cheer. So I'm sitting there thinking, now if we brought back competitive cheer to the district right now, how many more students could we engage in this process? My, and, 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 and just for the record, everything that I share with you, you can go online and find it. I tweet, our district tweets, Google us, it's there. Our students this year, we have three teams, only three teams, I'm starting with three and I'm celebrating those. Of those three teams, two of them have already placed in competitive cheer when they went to state competition. The first year, the first year. So I share that because we brought back this year as a, as a part of athletics, so many additional programs that had been taken away from our students that was important to them. And whether we like it or not, athletics is one of the things that keeps a lot of our students engaged to start with. It becomes the carrot to get them there. Then the experiences that we do with them while they're there is what keeps them there. So that's what I would do, continuing the conversations, engaging in the conversation, having conversation with the student athletes about what's going well for them, what could we do to better support you, not just on the court or the field because we wanna support you there as well, but how do we then take that into the classroom? to give you even more support. Thank you. Abdeen is here and he's going to ask the final question. All right. Many families feel overwhelmed and are disengaged due to the lack of knowledge of all the resources available to them. How will you increase parent engagement and provide resources to families? So I think the first thing I would do is, is, as I said earlier, I really would ask parents what else we could do differently. Like start with that conversation and then build the plan based on that. Because it's, it's, it's as I said with the students earlier today, you know, sometimes we create plans. We don't engage the people that the plans are supposed to help. And then we implement the plan and then wonder why the plan isn't successful. It's generally not successful because we've not engaged the right people in the conversation. So if we're looking to do something for parents, we start the conversation with parents. If we're looking to engage students or have more engagement for students, we start the conversation with students. And I'm not talking about a ceremonial conversation where we're doing it to check the box that says, okay, we did this because sometimes that happens. I know that never happens in CPS, but I've seen it in my almost 30 year career and some other places where it happens, right? Where you said do this, so I'm gonna do it. Now that box is checked. It's not about checking the box. It's both listening and hearing what is being shared with you, implementing plans based on that, working with those that have helped be involved in that process and tweaking when it's not going the way that it should go. Being very honest and transparent about that. You know, in, in our district, and I really do applaud our family and community engagement team because our family and community engagement team is boots on the ground. And I, and I believe that as a core value for me, the speed of the leader is the speed of the team. People rise to the level of your expectation. Just as we were talking about earlier, um, Grandma, over, over to my right, that at, we asked the question about performance. Just as we were talking about earlier, I believe that all children can be academically successful. So if that's my level of expectation, everything else that I do is going to be aligned with that. It's the same when it comes to the work that we're doing in our, in our building. I believe that, I believe that it can happen. So as, as the leader, if we work with the board, we've identified our priorities and this is one of our core values, everything else is centered around that core value. If the core value is student first, what are the activities that are aligned with that that says students first? If our core value is that we're focused on, we believe in quality customer service, how are we addressing when quality customer service doesn't happen? So it really goes back to the same thing around family and community engagement. Asking parents what it is, based on that, implementing those strategies, monitoring those strategies, tweaking them when they're not going the direction that they need to go, and keeping the open line of communication so that when it's not going well, we're able to discuss that as a family versus discussing it outside of the family. That's how sometimes we see a lot of things that get to social media because nobody's listening, right? One of the things that happened in my district, and, I, and I'll share this, 
is when we transitioned into the district, we had a lot of complaints, state complaints for special education that, that went to the state where parents were not pleased with what was happening. When, when we and the team really began to dig into it, one of the things that we found is they would have been happier if someone would have just returned their call when they called. Just, 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 just that simple. Now, I, I am not saying that we are 100% there. I am saying that we have reduced state complaints by over 200% because we just started returning phone calls. We started working with parents around what are your needs? How can we help you? We started really working with schools around where is the disconnect so that we can give you the additional resources or help you understand what it is that you don't understand. All of those things go along with working, work, being involved in working in the inner workings of a district for a period of time, knowing that when there are breakdowns, those breakdowns don't just happen. We have to, you know, we have to go back. When we talk about a, a, a break in the chain, that means the chain is starting somewhere. I was putting up my Christmas tree with my, with my daughter. And we know what happens with lights, right? You get one light that doesn't work and none of the lights work. Well, my 21 year old had just turned 21 and she's not very, very patient. So she's like, mom, these lights cost like $9. Can we just throw these lights away and not worry about this because I don't have time to find out where the missing light is. I'm like, no, money don't grow on trees and you don't have a job. So no, we are, <laughs> we are going to figure out where this light is. I use that as an example because when we found out where the disconnect was in the light, we could change the bulb and all the lights worked. It becomes the same thing. When we find out where the disconnect is in the system, we fix the disconnect and then the other things work in succession. Was that the last question? It was. Thank you, Irene. Did I do it on time? Look at that. Yeah, you're doing all right. So we've got just about four minutes, five minutes. Uh, if you want to ask a question, we can take a few responses from the group. Okay, okay, so there's a question that's over here for me, but I'm going to ask one question, and then we'll take this question. We'll make sure that we have the four. So it really goes along with the question that you asked me, but I want to pose that question back to you. If, if, we, if we enter into this partnership at the end of the first year, year one, at the end of the first year, what is one thing that would have had to happen for you to say we are going in the right direction? Fantastic question, and I'll frame my uh, my comment that way. Uh, in the first year, you mentioned the strategic plan. Uh, I appreciate the due diligence you've done in our district. Um, the strategic plan being in year three, I don't think because of COVID, there's been the opportunity for the community to engage and reevaluate where we stand. My biggest concern is our growth. The district has um, a strong public school foundation, but we also have parochial, private, um, homeschooling. Um, my concern is our growth and our market share. If we had it in our district plan and because of other factors we've lost growth, um, I hope within the first year we can reevaluate where we are and actually go on recruitment uh, and meet people in the locations and communities they are to bring them back to CPS. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. In the first year, I would like to see that our kids that are in quote unquote lower income communities and schools, because schools are, are rated and you have test scores. I would like to see that those children have a better opportunity and, ch and chance with reading skills. Without reading fundamental, we are never going to get them to where they need to be. Thank you. Hi, um, one thing that I would like to see is um, what I'm noticing right now is that there's just a shortage of educators and without really good quality teachers and enough of them and, uh, you know, teachers that represent the student body, um, our education system is nothing. And so currently a lot of teachers have been expressing that they do feel unsupported, they're burned out. A lot of them, including within our district, are experiencing a lot of verbal and physical abuse potentially as a result of COVID. So what I would like to see is not just support from the students, but also some kind of initiative to recruit and incentivize future educators because currently what they're seeing, I don't think there's a whole lot to attract them to become an educator. Thank you. 
And so in, in my closing, I think I'm closing right now. Um, thank you all for your time and thank you for engaging with me. Um, this is my life's work. So it's something that I am uber passionate about. If I show too much of that, I, I'm not gonna apologize because that's just who I am. There is so much more to the conversation for both of the examples, I, actually all three of the examples that you gave. I love the process that the board has put together with, with, our, with, the, um, with Alma, with the, with the recruitment team. Because in those other sessions, even though they weren't recorded, some of those same themes came up. So we were really able to talk about what that would look like, what work we had already done with that. When we talk about raising, or my track record, so to speak, in improving outcomes for children, that's based on test scores. So I just have to say that because that's the one tangible thing that people can see. What we know the byproduct of that was Children felt more loved, more valued, more appreciated. Students felt engaged in what was happening in school. Teachers were in a better place in terms of what they were doing in the school building. But all of those things worked together to raise student achievement. And so as we think about that, we really are thinking about it as a holistic approach, what's happening in the academic program, what's happening operationally, because we have to be good stewards of what we're doing. And then what are we doing in the area of climate and culture? Talked about the same for teachers as well. So thank you so much for that. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed my conversation with you and I hope you have a wonderful night. Thank you. Thank you, Arenita. Could have Marlon Stiles joining us momentarily. Welcome, Marlon. We're going to go ahead and get started. Hi there, Marlon. Can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear, yes. Excellent, excellent. Welcome, welcome. So just a reminder, we've got about eight questions we're going to get through in the next 35 minutes. You should plan about three to four minutes per question so that we can allow a few minutes at the end for questions and answers. And with that, we're going to have Chanel ask our first question. All right. Good evening. My question has two parts. The first part is how will you make student-centered decisions based on the individual school needs within such a large district with diverse needs? And the second part is how will you gather the individual needs of schools and groups within the district? First of all, thank you for being here tonight again. Excited to have some conversation with you to jump right into the conversation. Process matters, right? Um, to really talk about effective processes, systemic processes that lead to true uh, strategic focuses on systemic issues. Um, the question is about uh, how will we go about that? Um, I believe that if we truly communicate what our processes are, our all the time processes, um, and the systems that really are working within, it gives us a chance to make sure the stakeholders from the very start of the process are on the same page, right? Communication is absolutely critical when it comes to process um, and transformation. Uh, so my, uh, my, my approach as a leader would be to make sure that student groups, staff groups, community groups, a specific focus groups have a clear understanding of what the process would be for us to work towards identifying key strategic issues and more importantly the process of inquiry to really discover what the true um, issues would be at the center that are data driven right 
Uh, from there, the idea of how do we go about es establishing those priorities really involves an ongoing process with the same folks that have been involved um, as far as that, uh, that inquiry-based approach. What I would encourage us to really embrace is the idea of, of not just coming to the table, table to invite folks to voice concerns, but be part of the solution in the, solution in the decision-making process. Um, if our process is truly authentic, it creates decision-making tables, such as an environment we have in this room. It allows voice. It allows diverse perspectives, both from the building and the community perspective, and our students as well, truly inspire our decisions. Um, it really eliminates the possibility from a top-down decision-making approach and invites the relationships to make sure that we all are making decisions in the best interest of our children, our school system, and our community. From a building perspective, yes, um, I expect, I really don't like courts, I really do expect, right, the decision making at the building level, it should be different. I do not care if we have two schools in a, in a district or if there are a hundred schools in a district. Each individual campus has its own culture that contributes to the greater culture of the school system. So within that process, we should be working individually with campuses to make sure that yes, they are aligned with us as a district, right, and the trajectory I, thought that, I apologize. And the trajectory that we are on systemically and strategically, but more importantly, make sure that it's from a culture perspective that leadership is standing right alongside our building leaders and their teams to make sure that their efforts are aligning with the culture of their buildings and the strategic areas in which they need to improve. Communication is critical. Transparency is critical as we build trust and strengthen relationships internally and externally in the district. Thank you. Julia is going to ask our second question. Hi. Um, currently, there's an incredible disparity between the resources that are allotted to the schools. Sometimes this occurs between higher income neighborhoods and our underserved communities, and sometimes we see these differences between the schools within the same neighborhood. The disparity results in students having access to very different coursework, resources, and support. At the same time, this disparity reinforces segregation that is persisting in our district. As our superintendent, how would you work to disrupt this pattern and ensure that all the students can access the same opportunities and supports? Yeah, let's dig into that. I wish we had more than three minutes to talk about this. So I'll try, to, I'll try not to talk fast, right? So the board and the school district community enjoys a very bold anti-racism policy. Um, and it's an attractive policy, but it calls for systemic change. If the issue is systemic racism, then we have to transform the system. Um, data, facts, let's talk real fast. 32 point difference in ELA and gap closing between our African American students and our white students, statistic. 33 point difference in math and gap closing between our African American students and our white students. I could dig a little deeper if we had more time with statistics. But our findings, our reality checks that we have inside our data, they indicate that we do have a systemic issue and we have a widening gap, especially with the present of the pandemic, causing um, increased disparities and disproportionalities uh, specifically for our black and brown children. How do we disrupt that? Uh, I wanna start with the word culture, right? Um, if we're in crisis all the time, if we're trying to respond to crisis, it's difficult to strengthen and grow a culture that really embraces diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I would really encourage us to really entertain uh, the mission to really strengthen and grow a culture that not only welcomes that, but values it and believes in uh, the success of all children. It is important that we do critical culture work, that we invite people to be part of culture building so that we can have the real authentic conversations about that exact issue that you are bringing up. We need to disrupt it. Um, but as a superintendent, I need to create the conditions across the district that invite uh, individuals, that invite groups, that invite portions of our community and our staff and our students to be at the table, to have a safe place, to have the real authentic dialogue about not just the data, but the real authentic experiences. It would be my hope that as we start to really lay out our strategic plan moving forward, which I'm really excited about that process and hope we get a chance to dig into that, we really identify our strategic priorities. It sounds to me, and I don't wanna make an assumption, uh, that with those disparities in the resource allocation, the decision-making is not equity-centered. Um, that it's just kind of an in-the-moment type feel based on whatever data is available. Uh, but I would encourage us to really think about what are some equity-centered practices, processes, and decision-making strategies that we can develop collectively 
to really hold ourselves accountable for making decisions that are equitable for all, right? So one canvas might have this list of needs. Fiscally, we need to align our resources to support those needs. A different campus might have that as well. But it is about leadership, it's about culture, it's about structure and process, and more importantly, it's about truly valuing uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and that should live within our decision-making structure as a, as a school district. Thank you. Lisa is going to be asking our third question. In general, test scores indicate achievement. Why do you think there is such a disparity in test scores in Cincinnati public schools? An example would be the test performances in schools resembling High Park, higher income, and South Avondale, lower income. Why do you think this inequity exists? And what would be your strategy for closing the achievement gaps in a significant number of our schools? First, I'd like to say, and I've said this publicly as well, um, there is a, a concern. Um, that I have in regards to the state accountability system. I make no bones about it publicly that it needs to be reformed um, and completely overhauled. Uh, but to talk specifically about student achievement, the reasons why our students don't have a strong sense of belonging, right? As I dig deeper into the district data, not just the achievement data, not just the growth data, when I cross tabulate that with our discipline data, I'm finding that 61% of our students are African American and they represent 86% of our suspension rates out of school. 81% in school suspension. As I think about that, I really go back to us as adults, right? What is it that we are doing that is causing our students not to have a strong sense of belonging? What are the practices that we have in place that really prohibit our students from learning? Um, what are the barriers that we are putting in place that really uh, minimize the engagement of our students and don't allow them to have that real authentic, intimate connection to what it is that they are learning? What I would encourage us to really think about is how do we create greater access inside of our classrooms? And that starts with how we provide professional learning for our staff. Um, I'll give you a current example. Middletown City School District, uh, we are taking our staff through a series of professional learning as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion. But that centers around a culture of belief and we value DEI. Uh, more importantly, we're reimagining our professional development for our staff, going beyond just the receiving of the learning we're really challenging our staff to transition that to practice and transforming their behaviors inside the classroom. Uh, we're enjoying the initial conversation around micro-credentials uh, to really transition us to more culturally inclusive practices in the classroom connected to the content that we are delivering inside the classroom. It will take some time to transition, I truly understand that, but I wanna center my response to your question about us as adults, right? creating the cultural environments that are inclusive for our children. They feel welcome when they walk inside the walls of our schools and our classroom. I believe to answer your question that there are barriers that are present right now that really hinder the achievement levels um, of our children. Um, regardless of what side of the city that they live on, um, there are um, practices and strategies that we as educators uh, can improve to really accelerate student learning. More importantly, create greater access. I believe professional development is the key uh, as we start to truly transform instructional approaches and really focusing on more student-centered opportunities to really invite our students to the table, um, really become more intimate with their learning. I think if we can reimagine the connection between the standards that we cover and more relevant experiences culturally um, and real life for our children, uh, it would be my expectation that the learning would become more energized and electrified. Um, I know we talk about STEM, we talk about diversity, we talk about career technology, right? The best part about Cincinnati Public is the variety of choice the students have. We can accelerate um, and empower our staff's learning relates to transforming practice to become more culturally inclusive. I believe we'll have a better shot at really addressing the achievement gap that currently exists. Um, it would be my hope that we see changes in uh, discipline data as well. Uh, but more importantly, we'll see students, right, finding their pathway to be successful because they're in programs and classes that give them an opportunity to feel like they have a sense of belonging. Really looking for the opportunity to digging into that, uh, but that's a new age way of really thinking about tackling student achievement. It's not just about creating more programs, it's about transforming teacher practice. Thank you. Uh, Trent, is going to ask the next question.
based on what you know about the district, what would you want to accomplish in your first year of your potential leadership of CPS? How would you prioritize, organize the team, and move these efforts forward? And how soon should we expect to see some results from these improvements? Yes. Um, so the transition, the success plan. I think, first of all, the most important thing right off the bat um, is to really identify what the board's desires and the community's desires are and the district desire is to really create the strategic plan. Um, as I read the profile, the interest of the community, that was one of the um, most consistent themes and the feedback uh, that, that all the respondents have provided. So uh, the first key to that is to create a strategic plan and a process that becomes inclusive and engagement. Uh, number two, um, an immediate piece that I would like to do is begin having conversations with every single person that's been part of the interview process. There's a reason why you're in the room. There's a passion that you have behind uh, why you're serving the district tonight in this process. There's a perspective that needs to be heard uh, from, from myself as your superintendent. Uh, from there, um, it's about building relationships, both internally and externally in the district. Um, I'm not sure how long that succession plan may be, but I know an everyday effort is about investing and building relationships for myself. It's something I'm passionate about. Building visits, conversations with staff, conversation with student groups, getting out into the community, and I'm not just talking about sh shaking hands, but truly digging down into some relationship building to get an understanding about what we do very well and how we can scale that and getting a perspective about areas in which we need to stretch and improve ourselves and how we might go about doing that. Um, as you can tell, it's about information gathering and gathering perspective and really accelerating um, our thoughts around that strategic plan at the exact same time. Last but not least, what I'll say is we need to become more outcome driven. I'll share one of the pieces as well. Become more outcome driven in, a, in our purpose and our body of work. And it's very easy for us to just jump in and start tackling work and trying to get better, right? That's the theme of education. I would encourage us to become more purpose-driven um, in the outcomes that we're seeking to achieve. And last but not least, to answer your question for the sake of time, build an unstoppable culture. Talked about in other, uh, other, other groups. But to truly uh, empower staff, uh, students, community stakeholders, um, diverse groups of, of all makeups um, and different belongings throughout the entire city, and really build a, a culture that is made up of people. Um, it's not the culture of the superintendent the culture of the school district and the community that we serve. Uh, so really creating an environment where people feel empowered uh, to invest in the culture on a daily basis, creating an environment where people feel um, empowered to celebrate uh, the strong culture that we currently have and exist, and more importantly, empower folks to demonstrate a commitment to strengthening that culture um, on a daily basis and serving children. Um, when can we expect results? Uh, we need to expect results right now, right? We're in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, we need to set a recovery plan that allows us to dis demonstrate some metrics that students are currently recovering and can potentially recover a little bit more before the next school year begins. Um, so results have to be immediate. They have to be frequent and often. And more importantly, they have to be strategically uh, identified and set with a purpose that really impacts uh, some key areas that we've identified collectively as a school community. Thank you. Ozzy is going to ask our next question. Marlon, how will parent, student, principal, teacher, and staff voice be utilized or implemented into your strategic plan as a superintendent? And can you give us an example of how you've used stakeholder voice in decision making as a district or building administrator? Uh, I started off the conversation tonight with process, right? Um, and, and to kind of revisit that just a little bit, um, process absolutely matters, but communicating process um, and inviting individuals to be part of the process um, is step number one. Uh, so before we talk about strategic planning, we have to talk about how we're going to go about strategic planning. Um, and that's critical when it comes to relationships and communication. Um, as we talk about how we're going to strategic plan, we're very clear about the different types of stakeholder groups that we're going to establish. Uh, the purpose um, and what it is that they're tasked to do um, and how we might engage them through the process. That's step number one. Um, to give you an evidence of kind of combine two questions or two responses into one, uh, we just completed a strategic plan in Middletown City Schools. Uh, part of that process included a variety of design teams as we navigated the process to come up with our final plan. I have fallen in love with that particular process. Uh, I would replicate it, obviously, with different outcomes and, and content. 
uh, but the process is deemed effective because of the level of engagement um, that it generated. We had design teams made up of different stakeholder groups internally and externally. Um, we were able to articulate some things and some desires from a leadership perspective as a superintendent. Uh, but from that point, I kind of stepped back and the design teams made up of different stakeholders. They took the conversation and the dream and they ran with it. Uh, we continued to cycle back to make sure we had ongoing engagement. Um, and design teams are responsible for tackling those each phase of the process. Um, again, that was about stakeholder um, input, stakeholder, not feedback, stakeholder design of the content and the priorities, the actions and the outcomes as it related to the content of the plan. I enjoyed the process because it activated the voice of so many people who traditionally um, in the process of strategic planning would not A, be sitting at the table or B, have a voice. What I can also share um, as it relates to decision making with different stakeholders, I enjoy a group right now uh, um, and I title them Key Communicators. It's the most creative title I could come up with. Um, but it's a group of community members um, in Middletown City Schools made up of parents, uh, our faith-based faith community, um, retired teachers, um, you name it, we're just a very diverse group. We meet four times a year in person and I communicate with them through an executive brief four times a year in written form. Uh, this year has been a little bit different. We have we abandoned the written piece and we called it a, a meeting in its place for in-person conversation for input. The, uh, the group itself, right? Uh, we talk about executive level topics. Um, we gather input from the diverse stakeholder group and their content and their insight really drive my decision making as a superintendent. Um, it allows me to have better perspective from the community. It allows me to make better recommendations to the Board of Education. It allows me to focus on the needs of the students because it's coming from our parents, it's coming from our community members who are connected to them in a very deep uh, relationship way outside the walls of our school. In the past, uh, there have been conversations we've needed to make a decision about a $10 million uh, uh, decision about additional instructional space on the school building. Most recently, we've had to make a decision about how much of our ESSER three funds do we want to lean heavily in on our district recovery plan. Um, perspectives have been very powerful and it's allowed us to slow our decision making down, lean heavily in on the voices of our community and guide our decision making. I can tell you right now we've made a recommendation to our Board of Education that 34% of our uh, ESSER three funds that are remaining will be directed towards instructional resources to address some of the inequities and disparities in resource allocation. The process of that has been very uh, teacher driven as far as what the needs are in individual buildings at different grade levels. Uh, the process of the key communicators has led us to, to allocate over 40% of the remaining ESSER three funds for learning recovery plan and our parents were very clear. We expect you to lean heavily in on serving the children and addressing the impact of the pandemic that they have experienced. That carries a lot of weight, right? Those are perspectives that we may or may not have sitting in central office as a superintendent, but creating the conditions and the environments where people feel safe and relationships have been created, where your voice is truly valued and it inspires and influences in a very positive way, decision-making from the superintendent's seat, it leads us to deeper conversation with our Board of Education. We've been able to make better decisions for the sake of serving our children and our community because we've involved a lot of different stakeholders in the process. Thank you. Craig, we'll ask our next question. Good evening. Uh, fiscal stewardship is a critical role of the superintendent, especially given the size of CPS and our state funding formula. Can you share some recent examples of fiscal responsibility, which also allowed for new and innovative opportunities that CPS has been known for over the years? I can share, um, excuse me, I'm trying to catch my breath from drinking. Um, I can share that I'm currently a member um, and honored to be a part of the team of the Fair School Funding Plan, uh, the work group. Uh, last year, I worked with Claudia Zeller on the economically disadvantaged and the preschool categoricals. The team is still currently active. We're looking forward to our regional meetings coming up here in late February. Um, from the perspective of decisions that we've made, uh, we have had to make some uh, decisions as a district about how we're fiscally going to support our strategic plan. Our previous strategic plan called for some very bold, innovative things. Our current strategic plan calls for some even more bolder 
um, innovative approaches from an inclusive perspective. Uh, so relationships matter, I'll go back to that. And not to shout him out, but I will, I'm not sure if he's listening, but our treasurer Randy Bertram is part of our executive cabinet. We have just as much conversation, he and I, as I do with my curriculum and innovation director, my super, assistant superintendent, PR director, and we talk a lot about alignment. Um, the benefit that we have with the treasurer and superintendent relationship is so close um, and philosophically aligned in our beliefs. So we're able to match our academic and our social, emotional, and whole child priorities. Uh, we're able to match some priorities inside of our five-year forecast to support uh, the services we have for children. An example of how we've done some of that and brought some innovative experiences to children, uh, Middletown City Schools, and I asked what the second half of the question was in a second. We've been able to make sure that we're building a, um, um, a customized platform for our Passport to Tomorrow with a local vendor um, named Abre. The process has been truly about co-design, where us as educators and them as the uh, product vendor really sit at the same table and co-design a platform to support a key area inside the strategic plan. Don't have time to dig into it. But the idea is that the, uh, the fiscal priorities were aligned to support the district's desire to create a customized platform to serve our children. It serves as a very deep, authentic tool to uh, communicate, not just with our students and staff, but families and mentors that are attached, uh, attached to them. It will be my hope in that second piece that the Fair School Funding Plan does continue. Um, I cannot speak currently whether that's a win or a loss um, to anyone in the state. I just know that the essence of the uh, Fair School Funding Plan has equity at the center of it in its most purest sense. Um, I can tell you as your, your future superintendent, hopefully, uh, that my advocacy efforts locally, statewide, and nationally would be about serving all children, create as many opportunities as we can for them. It would be my hope that the ongoing efforts of not just myself, but the district, the board, and the community to stand behind the Fair School Funding Plan would allow us to entertain more opportunities uh, to create not just innovative uh, experiences for our students, but inclusive innovation experiences where all children, especially our most marginalized, are able to access the innovations in a very deep, authentic, intimate way. A lot more work to go. I know we've enjoyed one biennium budget with the Fair School Funding Plan. We've got a lot more work to do, talking about the studies, uh, really trying to uh, fight and advocate with our current legislators, really get us two more biennium budgets to fully implement that six-year plan, uh, but really celebrating the current wins, continuing advocacy efforts to try to unify the profession and the region uh, here in Southwest Ohio to truly really advocate, stand behind the plan to try to get it across the finish line for the last four years. Thank you. Kendra, we'll ask our next question. CPS is known for having a strong business partnership, community mentoring programs, athletics and alumni, how will you continue to grow and leverage these partnerships? Um, that, that is a blessing to have such strong partnerships. One of the things I make, think that makes CPS so special is how they value the partnerships that currently exist and what they're doing for children. Um, part of that success plan is we talk about meeting and relationships and conversation um, is to really hard line and strengthen the current partnerships that are in place uh, to really reestablish the value that they bring the impact they're having on children and the outcomes that they're uh, they're generating, right? Return on investment. Um, so a couple parts to this response that I wanna hopefully take my time and walk through a little bit um, is the idea of a bright spot, right? So if we have a program uh, that, is, that is being provided by a partner, uh, I really would like to dig into the true impact that it's having on children. If we are proving that that partnership and the experience that is being provided by that partner is really allowing students to thrive. It is my philosophical belief that we need to call it a bright spot and scale it across the district in as many areas as we possibly can, right? If it is good for some, it should be better for all. Um, and to just have a program and a spot through a partnership that is just good for a few, I believe is not an effective model. So it would be my desire, my philosophical belief to really find opportunities to scale when possible and scale where necessary. Uh, for the students that need it the most. I also want to talk about the opportunity to explore new partnerships. Um, we should always be entertaining through conversation with students about what their needs are, and that should be dictating the type of future partnerships that we go and explore. It's one thing to have 500 partnerships, right? 
it's more powerful to have 200 very intentional partnerships to speak specifically to addressing the needs of our students who need the supports the most. Uh, so I would encourage us to invite our partners to the table to hear from our children about what their needs are, right? Let's listen first, then let's meet together and have some conversation about, okay, where do we go from here? And what collectively together as a room can we dream up as far as a partnership and service for what the needs are of the children, right? I love dodgeball. I could have a dodgeball club every single day, but our children might not like dodgeball, right? It could be a dance club. I can't dance or lick. I have no rhythm, right? But more children might want to be involved in dance, and they might not have it at their school. I know I've looked at the after-school programs across the district. And they're not equitable, right? Fact, it's on the website. Uh, so as we entertain opportunities and partnerships, especially new ones, we really would like to focus on equity, but more important, that this student-centered uh, decision-making as far as partnership development, partnership expansion, and new opportunities for children as it may come. It is a blessing to have a community that truly wraps its arm around the children and shares that same belief that students are capable of so much. And to really value the partnerships that we have, strengthen those and explore new opportunities, actually creates that culture that we talked about early of people to truly believe in what's capable inside the school district and the children that we serve. Uh, so it will be my desire as a superintendent as part of that first year piece and then all the time behavior, right? Not just that first 100 days or 60 days or first year, it's an all the time behavior. We should have ongoing co partner, uh, conversations with our partners, talking about new opportunities, celebrating impact, and more importantly, bringing our children in to say thank you for the investment that our partners are giving. Uh, really celebrate those opportunities as best we possibly can. And I'm not sure about you, but I'd like to get as creative as we, we possibly may be about advocating for finances at the state level to make sure that we can support some of the, uh, the efforts that we have. I know from an advocacy standpoint, 21st century grant, some grant funding at the state level has really transitioned away from urban school districts and they're being dedicated to rural districts. I understand there are needs there, but we still have needs as an urban environment as well. We need to continue to advocacy efforts at the state level. Thank you. F. Dean is going to ask our final question before we transition to question and answer. I'm not sure who the timekeeper is, but I haven't gotten stopped yet. That's happened a we're couple doing, times. Today. We're doing all right. We're doing all right. All righty. Many families feel overwhelmed and disengaged due to the lack of knowledge of all the resources available to them. How will you increase parent engagement and provide resources to families? Parent engagement happens um, as part of our culture. We as a profession, it doesn't matter what school district is, but as a profession, um, it's something that we need to tackle, right? How do we engage more of our families? They are connected to the experiences that our children are having inside the walls of schools. Um, it is a, a, a model or a framework that needs to be dreamed up, highly effective, that can be offered to, to districts across uh, the United States. For me, spe specifically, it has to be something that not just I value, not the board values or just the folks in this room value. It has to be something that we as a school community value, right? Opening up the doors to our school buildings, um, to value relationships with the people that matter the most outside of our children and those are their guardians and their parents. Um, really taking time to slow our communication efforts down and make sure they're not just in response mode, uh, communication and efforts that are about culture modes. Uh, talking about opportunities, talking about processes, talking about um, materials that are coming out, whatever the, the conversation may be, but communication strategies um, that aren't just when something wrong happens. Uh, communication strategies that are all the time about everything, uh, that really offer our parents a platform to really access information as they need it, right? So we should be entertaining different digital platforms to allow parents to really opt in for different types of information so they are not overwhelmed on top of everything they tackle um, on a daily basis. There are plenty of platforms out there that make absolute sense. For example, Parent Square might be one, uh, just, just to mention for just a moment, right? The opportunity for parents to opt in. Some parents will tell you, I get all this information from high school about athletics. My child doesn't even play athletics. Right? That is overwhelming, 
right? To really creating a structure systemically that allows individuals, parents, guardians, grandmas, right? To opt in for the type of information that they're looking for. I will also say that it is absolutely critical that we make sure when we communicate, it's not some superintendent up here talking with educational jargon and trying to verbalize and articulate um, in an education acronym based strategy to make sure that we're getting our point across, right? I don't like big words. I talk math, but I can talk slope intercept form all day long. It's critical that when we communicate with our community and our stakeholders, we communicate in a manner in which it truly is understandable. We shouldn't have to translate the different acronyms inside education or the different academia experiences that we're providing in schools. We need to make sure that we can have general conversation and a deep dialogue around what it is we're actually communicating. And last but not least, I will say this for the sake of time, as we talk about truly engaging, we have to engage those that currently are not engaged, right? We just talked about a bunch of approaches for those that are already engaged and interested in, in, uh, in different types of engagement. What about our non-English speaking uh, families, right? Do we really consider um, restructuring our central office staff to make sure we have supports in place that when one communication goes out in English, that a variety of communications instantly go out right behind those that are translated in different languages, right? We talk about equity, diversity, and inclusion. Communication should be no different. We want our families to engage. We have to make sure that we're creating the conditions where they can engage with us, that they don't face any type of barriers. But that's relationship building, right? When we get out and engage our Hispanic Latino community, right? It's, it's a value statement. Yes, you are valued and your input matters. We need to be able to communicate. As we restructure here at Central Office, we have to make sure that we have the capacity to uh, communicate with all of our stakeholder groups and all portions of our community. Some parents have cell phones, some don't. Some parents like written forms uh, of communication, some don't. Uh, some like to go to the website. Um, and I'm not passing judgment, but maybe we need to reconsider uh, the structure of our website. I know I struggled navigating the website in preparation for interviews, uh, so I would encourage us to think about with stakeholder input, how we might go through some lean activities and maybe try to create a website where any bit of information you're looking for Let's create a, a challenge statement. What if you can get to it in three, kit, three clicks or less, right? A what if statement, right? That's a fun design process to figure out how we can restructure a website so you can find the most important information in the moment you're looking for, real time, in three clicks or less. Would you agree that's possible? I definitely would agree that's possible, right? So let's think about our communication platforms and efforts. Uh, let's include the different diverse portions of our community. Let's value diversity, equity, and inclusion and make sure that we're uh, creating the conditions to where all of our stakeholders can access the communications. And more importantly, let's make sure that a superintendent is not standing up here talking educational jargon about categoricals and a fair school funding plan. Right? But let's talk about school finance in a manner which our community and our stakeholders understand. We're seeking changes to the, the uh, funding structure in Ohio that our district receives the money it needs to educate our, every single child that we serve in a fair and equitable manner. And then Thank last but not least, I'll share this. I'll share this. I love communication, right? So let's have some fun. I'm a hashtag guy. Let's create some hashtags. Let's invite our community to celebrate the positive things. I was hoping this was going to be a question. But let's invite our community. Let's invite our stakeholders to share the great things that we are doing um, on a daily basis. Right? Social capital matters. We should be building social capital as a city of Cincinnati every single waking moment. Something positive is always happening. I don't know about you, but we can snap a selfie, talk about the experiences the children are having, how hard our staff is working, how our partners are coming to the table. We can be building that social capital. So when something does happen, right, we know we're all giving it our best. Communicating crisis when it needs to, but that social capital moment Really becomes more of a culture investment, uh, but it becomes more than just a superintendent. It becomes more than just a communications team. It becomes a culture where people, as I said before, are investing in the culture daily, and more importantly, they're empowered to celebrate the great things that we're doing, right? That's true, authentic communication. More importantly, that's engagement from more people uh, than hopefully we've ever had in the, the Cincinnati Public School District. We encourage staff, adults, kids, uh, faith-based community, whoever it may be, really celebrate the great things we're doing um, as, as a unified front.
Thank you, Marlon. Uh, so we have about five minutes and you get to ask the community a question and they get to answer. So I believe in these circumstances, right, that we don't trade places, right, and you don't get put in a hot seat, um, whether you're shortstop and got great hands still or not, but, but I don't believe that we switch places and you get put in a hot seat. But I want to create an environment like we did with the children earlier. Whenever the camera got cut off with the children, we gave them a chance to really voice what it is they want to be when they grow up. Uh, so I would like to just ask a question, and then I'll just be quiet and listen. I really enjoy the opportunity for you to celebrate. Um, as a community member who's here representing Cincinnati Public Schools tonight, ask some great questions. Um, the question I have for you, um, what's the best thing or the best experience you've ever seen a student have in Cincinnati Public Schools? We have four and a half minutes for a response. You could probably throw that to Tommy. He would catch it. They weren't that. No. One of the one of the best things I've seen is where a student who has engaged in the process in any Cincinnati Public Schools has remembered that moment 20 or 30 years later. When that student recognizes that teacher who and now they're towering over them. I remember you from then. And I know that that student has taken that value, that deposited piece in them and has shared it wherever they've, they're gone, they've gone. So I think that's, it's, it's a measurement of not the moment, but the lifetime of how we are creating students that are employable, enlistable, right, enrollable, and those moments when they say, and even come back to the district in one way, shape or form, and say, it's okay to go to Cincinnati Public Schools because I'm a product. I think that's one of, one of the most fantastic and phenomenal experiences that I see. Thank you, thank you. Love the passion behind that. On Wednesdays, I pick up uh, both of my grandchildren from North Avondale, Montessori. And it gives me great joy the way those kids run out the door. They are happy. They are laughing. They are talking to each other. The teachers are in front of the building. And the principal is walking up speaking to the parents. And it is such a, it, it, it just lifts your soul to know that whether they've gotten a good grade on a report or whether they've been in a little bit of trouble or whatever the case may be, someone could use that joy as a commercial for Cincinnati Public Schools. Capture that. Yeah, let's capture that. Um, something that I really have appreciated seeing, um, just as the daughter, granddaughter, and wife of educators, Oh, the classroom can be a sanctuary for children that perhaps don't have a stable environment at home. Um, I really have, it's really been touching to see letters come home to all of them that say, thank you for making me happy. Thank you for hearing me. Um, the role of an educator can be that turning point in a child's life who perhaps is experiencing violence, homelessness, whatever it might be. So a moment that has brought me great joy was being able to work in the schools as a, a counselor. And I had the opportunity of working with students as well as their parents to do family counseling and to see that some of the challenges that the, the student was experiencing was able to be mitigated just by inviting the parent in and to be able to have those conversations to bring about that holistic approach of healing to allow the child to be able to focus on education. So, you know, the students will come to me excited to see their parent come in the school, as well as be excited to share with me the progress that they have identified within their learning and their experience with education overall. 
one of the things that's been really, really exciting to me is I was able to partner with um, the tech school, Woodward High School. I live in Roselawn, and so that's my community. And they have a woodworking woodworking shop down there. Um, Wes Davis was their teacher. They built a house. I mean, it was a real life house. It, it, they had to have the water working. They had to have the plumb, all of that. The excitement that those kids had, that the fact that they did it, that's what gave me great joy. That don't fire up right there. I don't know it will. <laughs> Is it a tiny house? I get down at Wilbert. Um, you know, that's a very interesting question. Um, I'm a Rockdale, Burton, Walnut Hills CPS guy. I, 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 I can't imagine anybody having a better experience. Like when I say I am CPS, I, you know, I believe it. And I, the reason I work so hard with the district is because I've seen it work. You know, everybody in my family went to CPS, and they're all proud. My my sisters went to Hughes. They proud of Hughes. I know people with Withrow. I mean, everybody's so proud. Uh, Taft. Ep- I don't care school you name. Um, the great experiences. I every I owe everything to CPS. I mean, from Frank Perry to you know, Miss Stargley. I could keep going and keep going. And I think every individual uh, CPS alumni um, that had a positive experience would would echo those things. It, it's the it's those that didn't have a positive experience, and I don't have a relationship with that to to express. There are three people in my house, three Wanda Hills graduates, that all uh, have a deeply affection for the work that this district have done over, over decades. I remember in Walnut Hills when we played basketball there, the heat was always cranked up. <laughs> yeah, I'll leave it at that. Leave it at that. I'm just saying he he was always cranked up, so we a little extra Gatorade went a long way in the fourth quarter. We didn't press in the fourth quarter for some reason. Yeah, I would just add that. Um, oh, thank you also for for being here. I, I would just add that for me, um, and I know uh, Coach Ozzy sees it on on the athletic courts. Um, for me is when there's a, a student who doesn't have the belief in themselves and they find that belief through their teacher, their coach, their educator, their mentor. Um, I see it all the time, but we don't hear about it and we don't see it and we don't recognize those teachers, staff, and mentors who are actually doing the day-to-day grunt work. And so uh, I encourage more growth in that area. Not sure about time, and I don't want to break any time rules. We have time for one more. We can take one more. Thank you, Monica. Probably to me, the most positive thing, being a teacher and a community member, is seeing students who get opportunities, job shadowing, or career tech uh, with businesses in the community. Then later on, the next year, five years down the road, like our phlebotomy program, our, our our uh, relationship with the Cincinnati Zoo. The kids are still working there. They got hired. They're helping and volunteering to get the next group to be hired with that company and that partnerships. And I would love to see more partnerships and more businesses having the trust and and having our kids work with them then become uh, employees and then keeping those relationships going. To me, that's wonderful when you see it still in the community. They're very proud of where they went and they're willing to help the next generation do it. Thank you. I, I really appreciate the passion in the room. More importantly, I please appreciate the passion from CPS throughout this entire process. Uh, today has been very uh, fulfilling. Um, you've motivated me, you've inspired me, whether I become your next superintendent or not. Uh, just the passion of Cincinnati Public Schools and what you're doing for the children is definitely contagious, and I've really enjoyed the day. I'll leave you with this. I may not have all the answers. I might not have all the right answers. Uh, I may talk too fast, I may walk a lot, I may be very hyper, uh, but I believe in all kids, um, and I can promise you one thing, and I never promise anything but one thing, uh, but I'll give you every single thing I've got as your superintendent. Um, I've done it for 20 years in education. Uh, Hopefully my track record proves that I give everything I have for every single student, every single day, every single year, regardless. Um, I promise to give you that effort. 
Um, and I promise to empty my tank um, as often as I possibly can, trying to serve you, trying to serve your community, the city of Cincinnati, and the children of Cincinnati Public Schools. I wish you the best of luck with the rest of the process. I know you have a monumental task in front of you. Thank you for representing the voice of the community, more importantly, making the decision, the students at the center of it as you move Cincinnati Public Schools forward. Thank you so much for your time. It was so great to see some of you again uh, and meet some of you for the first time uh, tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can we, uh, can we give all three of the finalists that you met today a big round of applause to thank them for being with us? I have to say, uh, I know uh, the All My Advisory Group team is going to be joining all of you and cheering on Sunday for the Bengals to win the Super Bowl. We are super excited for you. And I know for the board and for the Alma team, Today is CPS's Super Bowl day. I mean, we had such an exciting day. Each of the finalists got to meet with principals, with teachers, with students, with civil service staff, and now with each and every one of you. And it just means so much to us in this process to have your voices here and a part of this. For the Alma team, I have to say it's days like this when we know we're living our purpose. And our, our job and your job is not done quite yet. So for the panelists, you all know you have a link to submit your feedback. We ask for the panelists to please get, get your feedback in before end of day tomorrow. For everyone else who is watching this, please go to the CPS website. There is a special link to a survey for you all as well. And you have until Monday at noon uh, to go ahead and complete your feedback. The board is going to read every single comment and feedback that you all submit, and they will take it into careful consideration as they make their final decision for the next superintendent. So with that, we conclude the evening. Thank you again for such a wonderful event, for the hard work of the panelists, choosing questions. It was not an easy task. Thank you. We wish you all a wonderful night and a great, great, successful Sunday. Take care.